my name is Niels Martin. I'm one of the faculty here at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and this is a little bit of an interesting talk. It's really all about surgical critical care and what Penn Medicine brings to its community. It's really a talk about kind of all of the inner workings of critical care. So it's not, there's, there's some data here, but it's not a lot of science. If you're an administrator or you want to understand all of the moving parts that go into an ICU, I think this talk will be also a little bit helpful. But really, I think the message is that here at Penn, we have thoroughly thought out critical care, how it's delivered, how it's measured, how it stays up to date with the needs of our patients and communities. And, um, and really, that's the value of this talk. So with that being said, I want to give you at first the mission statement of, of what surgical critical care is, and that is really the goal of improving the quality of care that's being delivered through thorough and thoughtful resource management when available, uh, as well evidence-based practice. And, and that's really kind of the goal of critical care. It's, a, it's an interesting thing because a lot of times patients come to Penn not because of our ICU, but because of a surgeon or of a specific disease process. And if it requires critical care, then they land in our ICU. But I think it's important for everyone to really understand that critical care is really an etiology in and of itself that warrants appropriate merit and is really part of the resource armamentarium that makes Penn Medicine what it is. And from the surgical side, we have specific surgical expertise that goes hand in hand with the surgeries that are done here um, to really optimize care as well. Um, just as a disclaimer, I have no real conflicts of interest to report as I give this talk. And so really, I think over the next little while, my hope is to define what surgical critical care is, where it's being delivered, what our capabilities are, what type of patient population we serve, and then talk a little bit about the outcome metrics that ICUs and specifically surgical ICUs and our ICUs use, and then a few of the special programs at Penn that tend to utilize the ICU often, and then talk finally about a little bit of the technology that's in use in our ICUs. So there's a little bit of background. Surgical critical care at Penn is really growing. It has had a pretty substantial footprint at HUP for many years. And with the expansion of Presbyterian Hospital becoming a trauma center, Presby went from two ICUs to I think five ICUs or four, I yep, five ICUs and uh, or five ICU teams. And I think it's, uh, it's been really a, an amazing part of growth. And Pennsylvania Hospital is now expanding uh, as the CMO uh, said this morning, Dan Feinberg, he said after, I forget what the exact number is, 260 some odd years in existence, Pennsylvania Hospital now has a surgical ICU as well as a medical ICU uh, as, of, uh, as of this summer. And so the footprint of surgical critical care at HUP is, is pretty extensive between the heart and vascular ICUs, the surgical ICU, and the neuro critical care ICU. And of course, the new pavilion that will be opening up in just over a year's time, which will house uh, several more ICUs. At Presby, the neuro, trauma, uh, and heart and vascular, and of course, the surgical ICU of Pennsylvania now as well. Just a little bit about our immediate catchment area. Our three downtown hospitals, if you will, are in kind of the center part of Philadelphia with a large catchment area really of west Southwest, South Philadelphia, and Center City. Um, but beyond that, our reach extends much farther into the county and into our adjoining states via the use of PennStar and our critical care transport capabilities. With really strategic location, and I know these have changed with time, but strategic location of our helicopters to really be able to reach far uh, into our community and really bring patients in to get the care that they need. So with that being said, I think HUP is kind of the largest footprint for surgical critical care, and it's really not just the doctors or the providers in the unit. It's really the entire team of folks that have been recognized in a multitude of ways. 
Um, I mentioned earlier the new pavilion is going up, and I think the start date is now probably going to be fall 21, just with some delays from COVID. But it's really going to expand our capabilities as well. And I mentioned Presby, which I think some of these numbers may be prior to the new pavilion and the trauma move a few years ago, uh, because Presby's gotten a little bit busier. And one of the neat things about the surgical ICUs at Presby are that when that pavilion opens, the floor layout of the entire institution changed as well to correspond with the ICU presence on that floor. And so, for example, that opened up the opportunity to do some really unique things. When a patient leaves the ICU, let's say the surgical ICU, the floor APPs come to the bedside in the unit and will take bedside sign out. When a trauma patient shows up in the trauma bay just a stairwell trip away, the next ICU nurse and APP to take a patient will often drop down to the trauma bay, watch that resuscitation, learn of their patient immediately upon arrival, and implement some of the care processes that will be needed uh, in continuity as that patient moves upstairs to the ICU. So some really neat and unique things that have come with the opening of uh, surgical critical care at Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, I mentioned the trauma service is, is located at Presby, and of course that's a state-of-the-art trauma center, level one, that brings in a lot of patients to the health system and of course then require critical care in the ICUs. Um, often the trauma surgical ICU, but occasionally the neuro ICU, depending on injury patterns. And so they kind of feed a lot of the volume that we see into the ICUs. The ICU at Presby is a really neat ICU. It won the, IC, the Society of Critical Care Medicine's ICU Design Award, uh, I think three years ago, for its layout. And it really is a state-of-the-art ICU that carries on all the principles and practices of surgical critical care that we practice at HUP and at Pennsylvania Hospital as well. And so really, we will bring to the bedside whatever the patient needs, whether that is advanced modes of ventilation and proning for ARDS, or from the surgical standpoint, the need for surgical interventions such as bedside procedures, tracheostomies, PEG tube placements, reopening of abdomens, opening of chest, creation of fasciotomies, really whatever is needed at the bedside. Our ICUs have that capability of providing that level of care or that level of support to our surgeon partners who also care for these patients and often are the ones driving their admission and, and, and presence at tent. With that all being said, you know, we have recognized, uh, been recognized by a few entities and, and really I don't put this up here to feel any kind of way about, about these awards. What, what I do think really warrants mention is that those awards are really not the result of one team or one person. Uh, they are really a result of a collaborative approach to critical care here at Penn. And what that means is it's not the doctors, it's not the providers, it's, it's, it's everyone. It's the advanced practice providers, it's the nursing staff, it's our nutritionists, who I always like to brag about because our nutritionists are the ones who write the SCCM Aspen guidelines every couple of years or part of that writing team who really sets the tone on a national level. It's the respiratory therapists who can teach anyone, including me, probably today still, things about the ventilator that I haven't fully sorted out. Um, really, everyone here at Penn is at the top of their game, and it's that collaborative approach to deliver the best level of critical care that I think really makes this place special. And so this was uh, the team at HUP a few years ago up on the helipad. <clears throat> I mentioned our advanced practice providers and, and I really think that they, they are very worthy of additional mention. We have house staff who practice alongside the intensivists in our ICUs. But one of the things that I think Penn has really invested in tremendously over the last several years has been its advanced practice provider program. And these are advanced practice providers, nurse practitioners, um, and, and physician assistants who 
all have added credentials in critical care and who have really made it their life's mission to become experts in critical care management and not just a nurse practitioner or a PA role. Um, they, they really know not just critical care, but how to interact um, uh, with all of the elements of the care team and understand how to move patients forward in their care. But as I mentioned, it's about the nurses, the respiratory therapists, the nutritionists, the pharmacists, um, who really bring amazing detail to patient rounds and optimization of therapies. Our physical and occupational therapists who are present in the ICU delivering therapy every day. Social work and case management who are thinking forward about the next steps of care, even while patients are still quite critically ill in the ICU. And our many, many consultants and expertise from nephrology to neurology and et cetera, who all come into the unit when they are needed and, and, and deliver expert consultation. And of course, all of the trainees who <clears throat> aren't just here at Penn to learn, but who are actually here uh, to, to challenge the faculty with questions and really make us deliver the best types of care because they are actively seeking out all of the options as part of their learning experience and, and really challenging the faculty to deliver the best care possible. And so really, I think that the team is, is an amazing part of that. And I think I've mentioned a lot about the advanced practice providers who really help with a lot of our patient throughput and long-term follow-up as well. One of the things that I always like to look at when, when I talk about the complexity of care is the case mix index according to the Center, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So this is not an internal metric. This is a, a national metric that hospitals use to look at how complex their patient populations are. And HUP and Presby in, in Pennsylvania Hospital, you can see there, and our, our two other uh, um, Pennsylvania-based partners, Lancaster General and Chester County Hospital, are also here in blue. But you can see um, that uh, in comparison to our, our partners in the region, we actually fare pretty well in terms of the complexity of patients that we care for. Um, and, and we really do care for some of the most complex patients in the region. And again, I think that just over time, that allows us to get better because nothing we see is ever normal. Um, part of practice makes perfect also allows us to actually have very good performance with this very sick cohort. And you can see here the observed over expected outcomes where one is kind of even, and if you're below one, that means that you're actually performing better than what would be expected. And again, you can see on a national landscape here uh, between HUP and Presby that we perform very well compared to some of our national partners in terms of the US News and World Report honor roll hospitals. And again, this is not an internal metric. This is a metric by US News and World Report. And so when it comes to outcomes and it comes to the volume that we see, again, this is um, uh, uh, one year forward. You can see in 2018, we, we actually performed pretty well. And I have to find a similar slide for last year as well until this year's comes out. But I don't think that the landscape is much different in one year. So switching gears a little bit and talking about some of the things that we do as a surgical critical care service to look at our outcomes and think about how we can advance the care we deliver is that we man maintain a database of all of our outcomes. And so, of course, and we'll talk about some of these, there are some administrative databases, hospital databases, reporting databases that are out there, but a lot of those administrative databases are not really adjudicated for accuracy. A lot of them use billing codes or other methodologies for which their primary purpose was. But really the primary purpose of this database is quality improvement, outcomes, and surgical critical care research. And it is maintained by advanced practice staff uh, with strict adherence to definitions, and it's been open for a multitude of years. And we've actually recently switched to a REDCap database 
And so prior to the switch, we had about 20,000 patients in, and now we're probably closer to 25,000, if not a little bit more. And so that really allows us to, to kind of dive a little bit more deeply and look at our outcomes. And so looking at that database, we can look at the volume of patients that we have cared for over the years. And you can see that, uh, again, each year we're approaching about 3,000 patients in our database. And I think once our ICU at Pennsylvania Hospital uh, is in full steam, those numbers will continue to go up even higher. And that 3,000 patients corresponds to over 15,000 patient days, which is just a tremendous number of patients to care for day in and day out. When we look at the breakdown of the type of patients we care for, I think you will also see that we really represent all of the surgical populations that are out there. And so whether you are internal to Penn, looking to expand your understanding of what we do, or if you're outside of Penn and you are interested in the type of patients that we can care for, I will say that from uh, the critical care standpoint, we really can take care of almost all types of of critical care. Um, some of our big players are, of course, uh, emergency general surgery, or ESS, if you will, on the hub column on the left. Uh, transplant is another uh, big component of what we do. Um, so immunosuppressed patients are a very uh, common thing for us to care for. Trauma at the trauma center is obviously a busy uh, focus, vascular, and they're very advanced Endovascular or hybrid techniques that they do for severe disease is also a large population. I don't want to mention everyone on this list, but you can see that really all of the surgical specialties, including OBGYN, and actually a fair amount of medicine is cared for in the surgical ICUs. And so the expertise is here uh, to really care for every patient demographic. One of the things that we also see ourselves in terms of a resource to our community is the number of transfers that we see. And these were just transfers from the trauma center. So our, our transfers in general are even busier. Um, but when we look at who, um, who transferred patients, you can see that the, those numbers continue to go up and up as we continue to be a regional resource to our partner or sister hospitals kind of throughout the region, if you will. I think uh, it is also worth mention that the faculty from the surgical critical care standpoint, and um, this is just a small part of the faculty in the surgical ICUs and the trauma ICU, uh, is not inclusive of the heart and vascular, um, the neuro units, or uh, all of the critical care that the anesthesia department delivers. But from the um, surgical side, uh, we really have a, a great group of intensivists who all bring unique expertise um, to, to the way in which we care for patients. Our model in the ICU is what would be considered a semi-closed model, and I think that this is the predominant model across surgical ICUs in this country. And really what that allows for is it allows for patients to come in under a primary team or under a primary surgeon to remain under the care of that surgeon. Of course, if you have surgery that is very complex, you want your surgeon to obviously be very vested in your care postoperatively as well. However, what the critical care team brings is that expertise for critical care, and so every patient who lands in the ICU has a critical care consult. And just so that there is no confusion over or issues with communication, we, um, the critical care team is the only team that is uh, allowed to place orders. And I think it really just makes a clean um, a process of patient care, patient handoff, et cetera. Um, and so that's why it's kind of a semi-closed model because you remain on the surgeon's service under their care, but you uh, have uh, the critical care team providing care and really uh, very much involved as your covering provider, if you will. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the other data that's out there that relates to the patients in our ICU. 
Um, this is the trauma quality improvement project um, uh, data that we got for our trauma cohort. And it's just a small component of the patients that we care for, but it gives us a peek into the care that they're receiving, and obviously a lot of their outcomes has to do with the care being delivered in the ICU, and so obviously a very important place for us to be looking uh, in terms of our critical care outcomes. And as you can see here, the trauma center actually performs very well, um, but they pay attention to their data pretty frequently. And so what you can see here is that mortality is actually really good uh, for the trauma center. Um, but when you look at the risk-adjusted major complications, they seem to be uh, a little bit elevated. And so along with the critical care team, the trauma center delved a little bit more deeply into what these complications were. And you can see that they were the diagnosis of acute kidney injury and pulmonary embolism. And so both of those things in a collaborative way with the critical care team became quality improvement projects. Um, and, you know, part of it is perhaps that we over-document uh, acute kidney injury uh, and that we have relatively strict protocols to look for DVTs and PEs. Uh, but certainly we're always looking for opportunities to improve care and improve our clinical practice guidelines uh, that help us optimize our care in a lot of these areas. And so this is just one example of the way in which we don't just deliver clinical care, but we are constantly looking at how to improve the quality of care that we deliver as well. Another big part of that is the leadership in our ICUs. Each of our ICUs has what can be described as a unit-based clinical leadership team, which is a multidisciplinary team between physician leads, advanced practice, nursing, infection control, respiratory therapy. All of the players that I mentioned earlier are represented on these teams. And they all follow their metrics. They look for trends. They do mortality reviews on all of the mortalities that occur, looking for opportunities for improvement. Um, and they even look at patients who bounce back to the ICU and look to see how their care could have been optimized prior to the first discharge so they did not bounce back, at least in an unexpected fashion. All of our ICUs have a very interesting reporting structure the ICU administration obviously is departmental based and, and so there is reporting to your department and to service lines um, that you can see off to the top left. But there's also hospital reporting and really direct reporting to both the uh, Chief Medical Officer, Chief Nursing Officer Alliance, uh, as well as to the Health Systems Critical Care Committee and, and actually to the critical care committees of each entity. There's also obviously the nursing and ICU leadership that I mentioned. And then really all of the partners in critical care that are involved in the delivery of care uh, in, in the multidisciplinary fashion. And I think we've mentioned most of these um, and we'll talk a little bit about telemedicine a little bit later. I mentioned that there is a health system critical care committee. And uh, again, I think for those internal to Penn you will know that this is really a vibrant uh, um, committee that is involved in a multitude of, of areas. But for those on the outside, this is really a way uh, for us to communicate advances in care, practice in a more uniform way, especially within units of similar patient cohorts, but even for the similarities between units in terms of ventilators or in terms of safety practices when we're doing bedside procedures or central lines, things that are similar across ICUs. This committee has really created the capability of delivering guidelines and policies and protocols and the ability to communicate those things and educate. Um, they also help with access and infrastructure and of course with some research and metrics as well. Uh, and, and so that critical care committee has a lot of subcommittees and work groups underneath it, and I won't go into too much detail other than to mention that it's a very modular system with teams that come in and out based on need. And as you can imagine, there was a pretty extensive COVID task force uh, in the recent months. 
from the critical care standpoint, both on the committee level within the health system, but really on the individual ICU level, we also look to have targeted priorities that in line with the health system's priorities. And so at Penn, we call that the blueprint for quality and patient safety that has a lot of tenets of continuity, engagement, and value. And each of our units really delves deeply into accountability, diversity, being patient and family-centered, and really service excellence as the tenets and components of um, how we target our priorities, both on the individual unit level and on a health system level. I mentioned quality work previously, and I think it, it, it really is important to understand that there is a lot of performance improvement that happens. There are some siloed performance improvement things, such as for the trauma center, for example, but really there's open communication with all of the service lines that bring patients to the ICU. We um, drive down specifically looking at outcomes and communicate and work very closely with the hospital CEQI system as well. And so I think that there's a lot of interconnectedness and a lot of data sharing and a lot of sharing of ideas to really optimize care as well. We have a host of clinical practice guidelines, both within the surgical critical care space and actually more largely now within the health system for guidelines that are actually relevant regardless of what ICU you're practicing in. And so with COVID, for example, we were caring for COVID patients in a multitude of spaces with a multitude of providers. And not each ICU did not need to create its clinical practice guidelines for ventilator management or non-invasive ventilator management or steroid use or extubation or tracheostomy protocols. All of those type things were created on, an, uh, on a health system level and then educated down to the level of the individual units and even providers. And so you can see here just a, a small sampling of some of the clinical practice guidelines that we have, but I think it's, again, really important to just state that we have these clinical practice guidelines and they are evidence-based. And uh, these are all things that, that allow us, I think, to practice on, on a really great high level of care. We also have some interesting call triggers in terms of escalating care when needed. Uh, and these are some of the triggers that kind of move patients and conditions up the chain of communication. Um, uh, and so, you know, it's just another nice piece of our puzzle that really doesn't allow patients to ever slip through the cracks, if you will. Every patient um, has, a, has a team with a very clearly defined role and elements to escalate their care as needed. Um, and, and so, really, I think uh, we are able to, on a monthly basis, kind of look back on our outcomes in terms of our REDCap database um, and looking at occurrences uh, within our unit um, to, uh, to, to, to think about what are the next steps in quality improvement. So one such project, and I'll just take you through one here as an example, is we looked at our readmissions. And what you see here is um, when we looked at our overall ICU mortality, which is in the lower right pie chart, you can see that in general, and again, this is very, very representative of a surgical ICU population, is that in general, our, our mortality rate lives somewhere around, you know, 3 4%, 5%. Um, and I think that, the, you know, again, a lot of our patients they are optimized in perioperative setting, and then they move on and do well. However, when we looked at our readmissions, so unplanned readmissions specifically, uh, because we have a lot of patients who go to the floor, but they have another operation in a week that was planned, and when that operation occurs, they needed to come back. We don't count those, but folks who had an unplanned readmission to the ICU, when we looked at their mortality rates, they were almost double what uh, we saw for our general population. And so using our database, we said, well, we really need to drill down and see if there's an opportunity here to really help these readmissions. And so one of the early things we did with that was our critical care outreach program, which is now many years old. Um, and what that was is to 
really look at patients after they've left the ICU, visit them once with our advanced practice provider program, and identify patients who might need to come back, identify issues that maybe we can do a better handoff to our floor team. And so that really worked with some reasonable success, um, but was really a, a busy process because we were seeing everyone. And so then we evolved um, to actually giving everyone a score. We called it the stress score. Uh, but that stood for a subjective transfer risk evaluation severity score. Um, but that really allowed us to kind of focus who best to see for outreach and see them in a timely fashion. And looking at our outcomes, we ultimately recognized um, folks who were at really high risk of bouncing back. And so we created a performance improvement project called the Green Sheet, literally because we were printing this out on a green piece of paper, which would hang on the patient's door once they left the ICU. And it really alerted nursing, respiratory therapy, and the primary team to the concerns that the ICU team had at the time of ICU discharge to keep them really up to speed in terms of outcomes. And so this really completely was spurred on by our readmission mortality findings from our database. And ultimately, uh, we were actually able to publish um, uh, some of our findings looking at the green sheet process. Um, and this was published a few years ago. Um, but it, it, we really found that that green sheet process improved outcomes and, um, and, and was really uh, a, a really neat quality improvement project. Of course, I would consider that research as well. We, we look at our outcomes and metrics, and I think it's important to get those things into the literature and, and, and consider them research as well. And so that continues to be an important facet of what we do in terms of um, our database, our protocol management, um, and our outcomes in terms of uh, research productivity. And then I think it's important to talk a little bit about some of the special programs. And of course, I could sit here for the rest of the day and talk to you about all of the special programs that Penn Medicine has. But some of the, I think, important and timely things that have occurred, obviously our lung rescue program is a big one. Our lung rescue program has given this talk on previous occasion, and I'm sure you can find it in the YouTube archive. Um, but our lung rescue program is a really, uh, uh, busy part of the heart and vascular ICUs in terms of looking at patients with lung failure and their need for ECMO, even initiating ECMO on the outside and flying them back home to Penn uh, for ongoing care. ARDS and, of course, COVID-19, I can't tell you the degree of critical thinking and care optimization and guideline creation that has occurred in the last several months here to really optimize the care of the COVID-19 patients. Um, we actually continue to look back at that care, looking at trends and, and, and looking at how we can continue to optimize the care of the COVID-19 patients. And we're even putting some of that stuff in the literature that hopefully will actually be timely available to some of our friends farther out in the country who are just starting to see their first peak. We certainly have sepsis programs that we have had for quite some time, and they continue to evolve as sepsis care evolves, including the utilization of the sepsis-3 pathways. We have um, many pathways for hypotonic saline use in open abdomen patients. We have the capabilities of delivering continuous venal venal hemodialysis, which continues to be a source of patient transfers where that resources not available at some of the outside hospitals. Obviously, transplant's a, a big component as well, and, and really, you know, the programs here are, are too numerous to count. I will mention that our emergency surgery service um, is one of our busier services in, in the surgical ICU, um, and this was last year's numbers. You can see that uh, the number of um, admissions primarily to the service uh, is, is pretty significant, but actually they, the service sees probably even more consultations from the multitude of inpatient services that have patients 
in different states that ultimately require general surgery intervention as well. Um, and so it's a really complex service that, that we really cater for. And so some of the common things that we see in the ICU are patients with exercising fasciitis, um, ischemic bowel, bowel obstructions, intercutaneous fistulas, really complex general surgical needs, the morbidly obese, and complex hernias. And so I think, especially if you're at an outside hospital, it, it's good to know that we really have the surgical expertise and the critical care expertise to hand-in-hand -hand care for these patients. Um, because I don't think you can really do one well without the other. And, uh, and so this is, you know, really, I think, a big part of, of what we do. Uh, we also have the Penn Center for Chest Trauma here. We do a lot of chest wall reconstruction after significant traumatic injuries or non-healing injuries or issues. Um, and this has really become a busy service in the last uh, few years since its existence. Um, and uh, it's a multidisciplinary team of experts that really are able to coordinate care 24-7. Um, and like I said, has become a, a busier component of, uh, of some of the patients that are being transferred in or even relayed in um, in, uh, in a more elective fashion. We do have some special technology. And, and again, I think this really extends above and beyond any one ICU. Uh, each ICU has the uh, technology it needs to care for its special patient population. And I think I mentioned a lot of the different resources and capabilities in the very beginning uh, that the surgical ICU specifically can deliver. Uh, we do use TEG uh, in the trauma setting and in the neuro setting. Um, it continues to be an advanced part of the care in which we deliver. Uh, this allows us to look at global coagulopathy, uh, not just specific um, uh, lab tests like our standard coags, but really look at all of the components of coagulation and really drill down and tailor our resuscitation for a patient to their specific needs. And so TEG is, is one of the things that uh, uh, has really allowed us to revolutionized, I think, some of the approaches to hemostasis and coagulopathy. Um, and of course, we, we look at this in an academic way as well, and, and we've actually been able to show that through the use of TEG, we've actually been able to refine our resuscitation management, actually end up giving the right products when the patients need them, and cumulatively then actually having to transfuse them less. And so that's a really neat component of, uh, of what TAG has allowed us to do in terms of change management. We do a lot of echocardiography. This is a commercial slide that I, uh, I stole from one of our um, uh, uh, vendors, if you will. But um, uh, we do a lot of echo, not just what you see here, transesophageal, but, but also uh, transthoracic. And it really helps guide our understanding of patient physiology and patient hemodynamics. Uh, we're using ultrasound more and more in the critical care setting, um, and it, it continues to be an advancing component of our uh, clinical armamentarium. One of the other neat things that we have is our um, uh, ability to real-time look at our patient antibiotogram and watch that evolve both with time and actually based on our patient-specific history. And so with uh, some of our industry partners, we've actually advanced our antibioticogram to actually look real-time at specific patient history, including their antimicrobial history, and drill down on the best antibiotics, either empiric or focused, uh, for their most recent cultures. And so that's another piece of technology that has really helped advance the critical care that we deliver. Um, another neat part of the trauma patients that we deliver is the use of whole blood in the trauma bay and, and how that has gone. And again, I think it just speaks leagues into the uh, way in which we are trying to stay cutting edge and really deliver the best care to all of our patients. Um, and the whole blood program, I think, is a really neat one. Um, whole blood, as opposed to component therapy for patients who are hemorrhaging, is a, is a really... <laughs> old and unique uh, way of looking at blood transfusion. If our patient has lost whole blood, 
then why not give them back whole blood? It has all of the clotting factors and oxygen carrying capacity and the platelets for which they have been losing. Uh, and so whole blood can actually be a, a really nice uh, a resuscitant uh, for those types of patients. And we've actually found some um, uh, initial preliminary data that actually shows that outcomes with whole blood resuscitation can actually be better even from the mortality standpoint. And then I think uh, uh, finally, um, summing up some of the technology, we really have a mature telecritical care program here at Penn. We're at the point where all of our downtown ICUs uh, have telemedicine coverage with two-way audio and video um, in every ICU room. And within a centralized command center, there are critical care nurses, critical care respiratory therapists, and intensivists who are actually able to almost physically be at the bedside virtually. They can zoom in on the ventilator waveforms. They have all of the films and all of the notes and the entire health informa information management system at their fingertips, the ability to communicate with the primary teams. And as you can imagine, this capability has, was profoundly beneficial in the last several months with the COVID patients, minimizing some of the in and out of the rooms, um, and really optimizing care because patients now had uh, an eagle eye on them as well as, uh, as their bedside providers. And so the telemedicine and telecritical care program has really, I think, although it's been at Penn for well over 10 years, maybe closer to 15 years, um, uh, it really has moved forward tremendously in the last several months. Uh, by virtue of the need and continues to be a pivotal core part of, uh, of critical care. And so with that being said, I think, uh, you know, I would uh, love to leave a, a few minutes here for discussion, questions, um, and, uh, and really go off on any tangents that, uh, that you guys may feel is helpful. Well, this was certainly a, a fun talk to give. Hopefully you found it helpful. It's a lot about the resources we bring to our community, but also I think in understanding those resources, helpful, insightful way of, of looking at how to optimize the care that we deliver in the ICU setting. I thank you for your time, and uh, if there are no questions, then I will end the conference.